The state of Kansas lawyering up in the fight over natural gas prices during last February's cold snap. Plus, evictions on the rise with the end of the national moratorium. How can you avoid losing your home? But first, federal money pouring into Kansas school board elections? That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. A federal political action committee is pouring money into 13 local school board elections across the state this year. The Sunflower State Journal reports it's something that could be a first for Kansas. Last month, the federal 1776 Project PAC announced it would begin spending money in support of school board candidates across the country who oppose teaching critical race theory or using anything from the 1619 Project in local schools. The PAC is backing more than 50 different candidates in seven states, including Kansas. Those races will impact more than 400,000 students. The districts affected in Kansas include Lansing USD 469, as well as Olathe, Blue Valley, and Shawnee Mission Public Schools in eastern Kansas. Here in central Kansas, the PAC is backing three candidates for the Andover School Board in Butler County. Game On for Kansas Schools is asking parents to oppose the candidates the 1776 Project is backing, saying, quote, we do not appreciate money from other states being used to influence local school board elections and encourage Kansans to support candidates running against those endorsed by the PAC. According to Axios, the PAC launched just this last May with a stated purpose of impacting school board elections. And here to take a look at this and other topics with us today, we have Adam Strunk, Managing Editor of the Harvey County Now. Thank you so much, Adam. And on Thank set you. with me, we have Dr. Neil Allen, a political scientist from Wichita State University. Thank you as well. And Neil, I'm going to start with you. Just how unusual is this federal interest in local Kansas races? Well, the Kansas connection is somewhat unique in the sense that it's connected to a particular national um, issue that's in national politics, um, uh, in this case issues involving race and the teaching of history. But this isn't totally new in American politics. In the 80s and 90s there were national groups that were working on school board elections, partly because of things like, um, like literacy programs that would use uh, in reading programs that would use text that had profanity in, in them or some people thought were, were unsuited for small or medium-sized children. And, but now the, uh, this is in some ways a new thing because it's also tied to a particular project that was the New York Times' way to look at the history of slavery. And so in a lot of ways it's fairly easy for a school district just to say, we're not going to use that. Mm -hmm. We're going to use many other resources, all that will talk about that slavery was part of the founding of the United States. Yeah. Well, and certainly in Kansas, it, it's kind of interesting to watch and see what the reception is going to be here, Adam, because I know as I talk to my viewers, they tend to be very leery at best of critical race theory and, and the teaching of history involving in slavery and, and all of that systemic racism. But at the same time, there's also a very independent attitude saying, keep your nose out of our business here. Yeah, there is. I don't know. I think that people are fine with people's nose in their business along with, as long as they agree with it or they perceive their side as winning. Um, I think that is, I've talked to a lot of people about it and you do hear a lot of concern on the ground, and it's like, well, are they teaching critical race? But if you have more of a conversation with people, be like, well, are you okay with them teaching slavery? Well, are you okay teaching Jim Crow? Because those are both examples of systemic racism. When you have those conversations, those same people are gonna say, well, yeah, that's history. And in that sense, like critical race continues to just be this boogeyman word that people throw out, but I don't know if there's a whole lot of understanding what exactly it means for people. So it inspires a lot of fear, but I think that if people really dig down, I don't think that they necessarily know what that means. And we do see that a lot in politics, Neil, where a, a certain phrase or word comes to carry much more significance than it actually does for those who use it for business, shall we say. Uh, that's right. And also the, the trouble with critical race theory is that it's meaning for the people that oppose it is so nebulous, so vague, that it's hard to even really figure out whether it's used in a school curriculum or not. And on 
on my side of, of the educational uh, you know, hierarchy or ladder um, within higher ed, there are scholars who use critical race theory who study that, but that isn't something that, you know, that is across our curriculum that we don't say necessarily we're going to have a critical race theory requirement in, in a university. That's not really how we operate. And so it really is, like Adam said, a kind of boogeyman which is being used by people that want to get influence on school boards. And what I would be worried about here is that people will be voting on basis of issues of what they think is critical race theory, and then they bring people into school boards that aren't going to support things like increased taxes for buildings or any of the other things that parents and citizens want out of schools. And Adam May, you had some comments on that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, it gets it gets attached to, I think it gets attached to some candidates like, look, people, despite whatever conservative, liberal, progressive, whatever political party people are, people, especially with their kids, do tend, for the most part, we've seen a little bit different during COVID, but to vote the, their interests or to protect their children. And so like a lot of people, you'll see people really supportive of bond issues for school districts and some small communities if they know it's gonna benefit their children or really supportive of some of these education initiatives well, the people tied to critical race theory are opposing it so strongly, those aren't necessarily the people that would have gotten elected without this issue. So I think that the point you're making is really good. I think you actually see that playing out in the Haven school board race right now. Yeah, and Adam, just a quick, your thoughts. Do you really think that this extra money will make much of a difference? Because as you said, when it comes no. to school board races, they tend to vote their interests. Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, it just depends. In a big city, yeah, I do see that maybe making a difference because it buys signs, it buys name recognition, right? But like most towns in Kansas, like everybody knows everybody, or you have any of a town the size of Newton that's 20,000 people, like even a town that size, like people have a pretty good idea of who each other are when they're running. So I don't see that moving the meter, but I do see kind of grassroots organization around these issues making a huge impact on the meter. Interesting. And, and Neil, perhaps that, that town size ex issue explaining the towns and districts that uh, the PAC has chosen to uh, involve itself with. Uh, that's probably part of it. And also, uh, I would guess that this, uh, the, the selection of districts has something to do with just the ability to find candidates. Because getting people to run for school board is difficult. It's in a lot of ways the hardest and least well rewarded job in all of government. And frankly, I'm surprised that we're having contested elections as much as we are this, this fall, at, w when you consider the really difficult last couple of years for mm -hmm. schools in this state and everywhere else. And definitely, we're gonna take a look at that now. You know, here in Kansas, the biggest issue facing school board candidates and current school board members it hasn't been critical race theory, but mask mandates. In the last week, several more districts have had to close school doors due to COVID outbreaks. That includes Rock Creek School in Pottawatomie County, Heston Middle School and Halstead High School in Harvey County, and all of the St. John Hudson schools. Kansas Education Commissioner Randy Watson says in total, 31 Kansas schools are reporting COVID-19 outbreaks right now. Even so, in many districts, masking mandates remain controversial. <laughs> A Thursday morning, dozens of Cape and Mount Carmel parents gathered outside of the school to protest a requirement mandates. This followed a similar protest the day before at Bishop Carroll. The school's website says masks are being used to limit quarantines for homecoming next week. The ongoing battles and rising numbers of positive COVID cases have some wondering, though, if the governor will order masking at the state level again. Cake's Taylor Bozer caught up with her at the state fair to find out. Kansas State Fair is back. Fairgoers will see plenty of fair food, carnival rides, and even some masks. With a lot of people, even when we go in the stores and we go inside, we put them up, we put them on. It's just safety. But for the most part, people weren't wearing masks. My perf personal preference is not to wear a mask. We, fit, we weren't going to wear a mask. We're outside. We've been vaccinated, so we feel like we're safe. As for Governor Laura Kelly's thoughts on masks. No, no plans for a mask mandate. And she says she has no plans for requiring the vaccine either, but she is strongly encouraging it. 
get it done because it is the only way that we're going to be able to get rid of these masks permanently uh, and we're going to be able to ensure that our kids stay in school learning uh, with a teacher in front of the classroom uh, and, and the only way that we can ensure uh, the, the success of our business community. So President Biden released his plan for workplaces with 100 or more employees. It requires anyone who isn't vaccinated to get a weekly COVID test. I don't plan to uh, replicate that on the state level. You know, the, the federal mandate would be uh, all that would happen. So uh, we will see uh, what, it, what it really means. For now, she's waiting until kids 5 to 12 years old are eligible to get vaccinated. When that comes down, uh, you can bet that we will be in our school buildings uh, all over the state uh, working to get uh, our kids vaccinated so that they're safe. And Adam, I know uh, as I speak with viewers, oftentimes this is what they want to hear. Is this kind of the same feeling that you're getting from your readers? Yeah, a couple points. Point of clarity, um, speaking with our Halstead editor, Halstead High School did not close. I do cover Heston. I do not believe we had closures. I read a similar article the other day and I found it a little bit confusing. Um, but yeah, no, the school board meetings are really intense and you can really see the community split on this. Like I covered two Heston board meetings in two weeks. Heston, the first meeting, you had 10 parents saying, hey, look, all the science is here. Our kids can't get vaccinated if they're a certain age. Just don't have masks for the little kids until we get through the spike. Everyone came out. The next meeting, there was 10, 15 parents who said the exact opposite, who were very, very aggressive on, we don't want any kind of masking, who had all sorts of other suggestions. So yeah, this is a this is a huge ground issue. Like, I mean, it's tough cover. Like the meetings have been tough. Like the meetings have been hours and hours long. Um, people are really, really fired up. Uh, it's a very personal issue to people. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the number one issue going on, at least locally for us in school board meetings. Hey, thank you for that information there, Adam, about Heston and Halstead. That did come from the Associated Press, which is kind of one of our main news sources <laughs> for anybody in journalism. So uh, we'll definitely have to check on exactly what's going on with that. But as we look at this issue, you know, Adam talked about how long and how emotional the meetings have been there. We're seeing the same thing. Really kind of surprising, as you said, that there's anybody even running for school board right now. Well, that's that's true. And also that, I mean, this is going to be a really difficult issue in schools because schools are places where we have lots of unvaccinated people because they're not allowed to be vaccinated yet. We also have close quarters of people. And the science is clear that vaccination is the best way to, uh, to stop the spread. The second best way is a mask, which is a tool that is necessary now to, to give us our best chance of being healthy. It's something that you need to use in schools if your role is, is to be there. Just like 20 years and 20 pounds ago, I was a basketball official and I used to wear one of these. This is a, it's a whistle. And I needed to wear that to do my job in a, in a school setting in a clo enclosed gymnasium. Now with COVID still killing lots and lots of people, a mask to wear is also a necessary tool to do the job of being a safe person in a school. Yeah. Well, and we also know that uh, there's been a lot of political pressure on the governor not to in put in any more mandates, not to do any more COVID restrictions of any sort. It, it, do you think maybe there's some bending to that political pressure with the upcoming uh, reelection campaign next year? Well, Governor Kelly is probably the most vulnerable governor for reelection anywhere in the country because she's a Democratic governor in a strong Republican state. But also, as we've seen over the last year and a half, when Governor Kelly tries to, to enforce mandates that follow public health guidance, she gets a lot of pushback from the legislature and from constituents that believe that those mandates are a denial of individual freedom. And so I think it's also possibly not worth the effort for the executive branch of the state government to try to do the same kind of restrictions that they were doing a year ago and just to let the federal government do what it can. Yeah. And one other thing I want to look at as we're talking about these mask mandates and school closures, Adam, I know that I've talked with a lot of parents uh, who have been very frustrated because of the new state law that basically doesn't allow remote learning to happen at this point. And they didn't realize that this was going to be the result that kids were going to, you know, kids who had high risk, close contact were going to have to be doing this regular testing 
or not be able to be in school for days on end, maybe multiple times throughout the school year. A lot of frustration as they're seeing what this law is doing in real life play out before them. Are you hearing and seeing the same thing? Yeah. Well, those are those are the parents you're seeing hit, right? Like last go around with COVID, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of kids that do have health issues, that do have immune issues, parents that are just concerned about their kids. Last go around, they had the choice, right? They could keep them at home, they could send them to school, and that at least allowed them to kind of make a choice. This year, they're all talking about choice with masks and stuff, but you have these parents who do want to keep their kids safe. And I mean, they're, these parents have a point, like we have way more cases in our schools this go around than we did last go around, mostly because we don't have mask mandates, which again, that's up to the parents, it's up to the school board. But you have a lot of parents who want to do everything they can to follow health regulations. They want to keep their kids safe. They've got their parents live in the house with them. They want to keep their family safe. And their choices are don't send your kids to school and homeschool or send your kids in, have them wear a mask, but not be protected from other kids, at least the ones that can't vaccinate. So yeah, I've heard from a number of parents um, about this concern. And yeah, it's a it's a tough deal for these parents. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the legislature does when they reconvene in January. Meantime, not just masks, but evictions are an issue as the pandemic continues with the end of the national eviction moratorium. More Kansans than ever need help paying their rent or their mortgages. Rebecca Chung of the KSN Capital Bureau takes a look at how you can get that help. Agents fielding hundreds of calls and more being brought in to help the load. Right now, more than 27,000 Kansas households are behind on rent payments, and officials say the numbers are shocking. Each one of those are families. Each one of those have a home that may be lost in the very near future. So far, more than 7,000 households in the state are receiving help. With the surge in people applying, housing officials hope the process will be a little smoother, ramping up efforts to get renters the help they need as quickly as possible without having to go through a lengthy process of uploading more documents. Recognizing that uh, the Department of Treasury is now allowing certain self-attestations, which allow us in turn to process applications much more efficiently, getting those dollars out the door to people in need. At the Capitol, I'm Rebecca Chung. And Adam, I know that uh, a lot of people would say, well, this was very predictable. We, we've been kind of expecting this mass number of evictions to come once the moratoriums ended. But at the same time, there are lots of programs, but they're not always easy to find. And once you can find them, they're not always easy to work your way through. Um, yeah, I think that this being completely expecting, like expected was, that is correct. I mean, this program was going to have an end. I mean, there's got to be an end to it sometime, right? Like someone's got to pay rent eventually. Um, but yeah, no, and there's a, it's a question of access, right? So like I can bring up one of these programs because I have a phone, I have an internet connection, I have time to look this stuff up. When you don't have those things, like, yeah, that's, that's really difficult. Now, I know there are a lot of people working out in the community, a lot of nonprofits that are trying to connect these people with the services they need, and that's great work. But yeah, it is it is difficult when you don't have that kind of access. Yeah. Well, and it's not just the access to it's because there's more than just the rent bill, the mortgage bill to pay to be able to stay in that home. Things like your utilities, your energy. Remember that really yeah. cold spell last February and the yeah. heating spike that we saw when those costs went through the roof? Well, the state has been uh, investigating whether or not that that is price gouging. The attorney general now asking for some legal help in that investigation. This week, he announced the plan to hire a law firm with expertise in the natural gas market to help with the rest of the investigation and any potential civil litigation. In the meantime, Kansans could see a price jump after a ruling from the KCC. Kixi Lai Higgins explains. You know, we were braced for that. We were kind of hearing the news reports and thought, well, Let's see where this goes. Tom Gard is talking about the Arctic blast that swept the state in February, bringing with it astronomical natural gas prices. The index price on February 1st was $2.54. On February 17th, it was more than $620. That is a 32,000% increase in 16 days. We believe that that's wholly inaccurate. Jim Zakora represents a group called the Natural Gas Transportation Customer Coalition that's been trying to get to the bottom of it, but it's hit a dead end with the KCC. We asked the KCC to permit us 
to investigate the index and to help us. The KCC said in a statement Thursday that while the NGTCC may raise legitimate concerns, this commission is simply not the forum for such an investigation. It added the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission would be the ones responsible to do the investigation, something Zakora worries will end it for good. Essentially, they, they sent the entire economic problem, or I would say the economic mess of Kansas back to Washington, D.C., where we'll probably never hear of it again and certainly won't hear of it for several years. To mitigate the cost, Wichita residents will have to pay about $600 each. The question now is when and in how many installments. The commission is going to probably give KGS 10 years to collect seven days of natural gas costs. Let's get a resolution here and see if we can't, you know, make sure everybody can can adjust to it and, and without significant impact on their household. Ten years to collect seven days worth of natural gas costs. A, most people I speak with say that sounds like price gouging to them. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I lived through here in Kansas that catastrophe of a February Arctic blast. At Wichita State, we were lucky to be able to have class most of those days mm -hmm. for most of the time. Um, it's really a, a giant problem then. But also at that point, you have to generate the power from somewhere. And, uh, and it does seem like price gouging, but the idea of price gouging is a really, really dangerous instrument be, to be used by a government entity because all of us see prices go up and down all the time. And if businesses are going to be subject to to that kind of scrutiny frequently, then it's going to be hard for them to stay in business and have a, and be able to to have a risk tolerance. But you know, with glo global warming and human caused climate change, we are going to have things like February happen much more often. And so this really takes every government to pay attention. And seeing how the federal government is doing its business right now, I hope we're going to have a debt ceiling increase in a budget in a week or two. So I don't know if trusting the federal government on this is really the best option right now. Well, and Adam, you know, I, I've looked at a lot of these payment plans as they've been coming out over the last uh, couple of months, really, and they've all kind of had the attitude of, well, we'll take the payment now, and if it turns out to be price gouging, we'll give it back to you. But when you're talking... Yeah. 600 bucks doesn't seem like a lot, but I've talked to people that it was tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's hard for me to sit still right now. Um, <laughs> we've reported and reported and reported on this issue. Um, and it's it's incredibly frustrating because you're talking about seven days, right? 10 years to pay off seven days. If it happened again this winter, we'd be in the same spot. Like at the time, everyone in Topeka, you were up there, everyone was like, there ought to be a law. They ought to do something about this. And nothing happened. They did something where they helped the cities not go bankrupt in the municipal pools. But outside of that, I mean, now it's, let's see, the end of October, the state might have hired someone outside to look into if it should investigate and sue for price gouging. The KCC charged with protecting people, protecting our interests, we're gonna punt because we're not the forum for protecting people's interests. So like, no, this is, a, this is a big issue. And we wrote an editorial this week, Kansans are getting left down the cold. Like we're on our own. Like my advice to Kansans, like start getting some caulking, cock your windows, start getting some weather strips. Cause like you're taking care of yourselves. They're sure not taking care of you. All so right. no. And on the other side of price gouging, like it's 320 times the regular amount. That is price gouging. You can say that there's risk here and risk there, but here's the deal. No one ran out of gas. We all got gas somewhere. So they had gas. So somewhere down the line, someone made a ton of money and we all are gonna be spending 10 years paying for their third, fifth, 17th house. Well, some good points there. We do have one more story to talk about though. So I know Neil's looking at me, he wanted to make some comments and we don't have time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Voting rights attorneys battled it out before a judge this week in Shawnee County over whether a new state law that threatens felony prosecution for any activities that could be mistaken as the work of an election official is a violation of your rights. 
The argument over what restrictions House Bill 2183 puts on nonprofits like the League of Women Voters headed to court this last week. The groups halted all voter registration drives and outreach efforts July 1st when that law took effect, saying they didn't want their volunteers to face prosecution for registering voters. Bradley Schlotzman, a Wichita attorney working for the state, said the nonprofits have manufactured a crisis and that the only way to violate the laws is by intentionally confusing voters. Plaintiffs are effectively thrusting at lions of their own imagining, he told the judge. The nonprofits are asking District Judge Teresa Watson for a temporary injunction to block that part of the law, saying it's too broadly written. The law prohibits, quote, conduct that gives the appearance of being an election official or would cause another person to believe a person is an election official. The attorney for the nonprofit said volunteers are often mistakenly perceived as election officials. This is about people's perceptions, subjective perceptions, he told the judge. In this political environment, we've seen, particularly in the aftermath of the 2020 election, people's perceptions about elections and elections officials be wildly incorrect. All right. And we, we, a lot of talk over possible concerns needing to tighten up security after the 2020 elections. But how much of an impact does losing the voter registration drives that these groups do have on Kansas elections? It'll have a huge impact if what you care about is people being able to exercise their right to vote. Because if you want to mobilize people to vote, particularly that are low um, likelihood voters that don't vote terribly often, that you have to go meet them where they are. And also you have to give them information about elections. And our elections in this country are insanely complicated. And the registration process is often very complicated. And also it's hard to figure out for a lot of people, where do they register? How do they register? What time do they have to register? And then they have somebody coming to them to, to say, look, I'm going to explain to you the rules. Here's a document that shows you what the, what the, all those rule, rules are and how they apply to you. So that looks a lot like a government official. And we have outsourced the work of voter registration to these groups because our governments are not willing to do the work. And so this particular kind of law has the, has the purpose and will have the effect of making it more difficult for people to vote. And if we care about people voting, then the nonprofits on this is, are the way to go. All right. Well, Neil, Adam, I want to thank you both so much for joining me this week. We'd also like to thank our news partners at Cake News, KSN News, and the Wichita Eagle for sharing their materials with us. We really enjoy these conversations and would love to continue them with you online. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or PBS Kansas on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. For now, we're out of time. Stay safe and have a great week.